it is Thursday, June 4th, 10 o'clock. This is meeting Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Um, and we are gonna be talking today about um, a variety of issues around Act 250, various bills, and uh, in particular focusing today on force blocks, habitat quarters, and protecting them. Um, so uh, we've asked uh, Representative Chair Sheldon from House Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife and join us to kick things off. Um, you sent us uh, H926, which includes uh, forest block protection work, habitat quarters. Uh, you've worked in the past on H233. We have a very similar bill, S165. So it's a, of interest to all of us. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask you to, in the work you've sent us, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, opportunities you saw or and or problems you saw and how you address them in 926, what you would like us to be thinking about. Sure, thanks for having me. And it is great to see everyone. Um, I haven't seen um, Commissioner Snyder since this whole thing started either, I don't believe. Well, hello. Great to see you, Representative Sheldon. Yeah, I've seen um, others. Hello, Commissioner Walk. Um, anyway, great to see everyone in your virtual offices. And I have a new puppy, so excuse me if she barks. Um, we're working on it. <laughs> so I'm so glad you're taking up forest fragmentation and habitat connectivity. Um, for me, it's like a cornerstone piece of our work in H926, and um, its timeliness couldn't be more important. I think COVID has made us very aware of things we need to address in our society. And in the environmental realm, I would say that protection of our forest resources is very much at the top of the list. We know, and Commissioner Snyder can speak to um, all of the data behind what drives the goals in having um, Act 250 include habitat, forest fragmentation and habitat connectivity as a criteria um, for review of projects that are already under the jurisdiction of Act 250. Um, the data has been very compelling for a long time. And what we know that's really important is that uh, fragmentation is increasing. And my sense is that through the COVID crisis, we're gonna start seeing more kind of urban refugees and the pressure on our outlying landscape is likely going to increase. And I understand that you're considering an Act 250, um, 926 pared down version in, in, I don't know, I'm sorry, the Senate number for the housing bill, but Pairing those two things together makes a lot of sense to me and looking at increasing opportunities to develop in our downtowns and places that we would like to see development. And um, then um, more closely regulating, you know, a criteria in Act 250 doesn't prohibit development in an area, but it, it guides it. And the goals are the same in both H233 or your S165. And I do have a question. I think S165 is, is or is it as past H233, or are there changes? Uh, they're very modest changes, but basically um, almost two years ago, uh, I took H233, which we passed out of the committee, but couldn't get over the finish line out of the Senate. Uh, that session ended. I was sorry that we hadn't been able to get all the way back to the house. So uh, basically cloned that bill, reintroduced it, so we would have that opportunity to work on it directly, um, not knowing how the Act 250 process and bills would play out. Yes. So um, just to kind of finish on, on the why it's so important, um, I would say that you know, we're in an extinction crisis, and we need more now than ever to protect um, habitat. It's sort of the number one, although climate change is um, hand in glove with threats to our um, other species, as well as to ourselves, quite frankly, um, for life on the planet. We need our forests to remain intact for all the benefits they provide us around carbon sequestration and um, water quality and clean air. Uh, and so I think it's a, a really important time for us to include this in updating our statewide land use uh, development review law. The key differences between the bills that I see Oh, actually I have one more. I think, and I know you were all in that great presentation we saw, but I think reiterating the importance of Vermont being at the crossroads of um, our region as in terms of the diversity of our bio, biophysical uh, landscape 
and the critical nature that we play in species um, adapting to climate change. And so that to me is also a very important piece of why we need to protect our intact forests and the connectivity um, among them. Sure. Are you referring to the, the Nature Conservancy presentations we had in room 11 there? Yes, yeah. yes. And um, as a side note, you know, I think one of the, one of the um, pieces of that critical uh, habitat we included in our bill, which didn't make it, did not make it over in H926 was trying to increase protections above 2000 feet. And I think it's important to understand why, because we took testimony from biologists who said that that elevation difference, that's part of what makes our biophysical landscape diverse and also really critical to species survival. Um, and that has been identified as a key, key area um, in the landscape for species to adapt as our climate changes. Um, but I guess what I would say is that the goals and the intent of both of the options that you're considering here are very similar. They can be legally, they're structured slightly differently. Um, and we, uh, as you know, passed out the version that included um, more direction for protection of forest blocks and habitat connectivity in the criteria and statute in working with the administration and on the joint proposal with um, VNRC, you know, we, we became convinced that, the, that, well, the preference for the administration at that time was to do, um, look at that more through rulemaking and have the statute be providing the framework for the rulemaking. And that's the direction that we headed in H926. So I think that's the single biggest difference um, between the approaches as you consider, um, you know, which policy direction that you wanna, you wanna take. Um, as I look more closely, they both include, you know, resource mapping as an element for this. That's been something we've worked through and um, is a piece of identifying and helping administer a criteria that includes forest blocks and habitat connectivity. I actually believe they both change the burden of proof. Ellen can help, help us with that as well. Um, and you know, aside from that, I know you're looking at the peaks and the, and the bigger pieces that you can take from H926, but there are some <clears throat> complementary pieces along the way that you might hear about, but I think that Bill Back is one of those. I think we are, um, the, the H926 does include Bill Back for the review time that Fish and Wildlife Department spends on Act 250. We, we believe that that's an important piece of H926. Right, We've, that's um, actually sort of on our short list of- Yeah, good. Okay. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, I just think that this is a, a, a very important complement to um, other pieces of the bill that you are also contemplating through the housing changes. And I hope that we can find a path forward for it. And I'm open to questions that you have. Well, uh, I'm not wearing my be optimistic button right now because I don't have my outdoor coat on, but um, mentally I am. So I have some questions about the different pieces. Um, uh, we haven't talked this morning yet about uh, trails and that's really one of the topics. We talked about a week ago about it and we're gonna come back to it tomorrow. Um, were you satisfied with the the 926 as it pertains to trails when it came out, because I think of them as related to forest block work, of course, as well. Yes, I, I am satisfied with that. Okay. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, triggering an examination or thinking about forest blocks and fragmentation, uh, 233, 165, both include sort of the a mapping based approach to looking at when you would in, in address those concerns. And um, the bill as we have it now has a, um, you know, a quantitative measure, 2000 feet of, of road into a, uh, an area. So the fairly different ways of looking at what would draw you to review? I don't know that the rules and the actual process for what would happen once the trigger is triggered are mean all that different, but what triggers the review is quite different. Can you say something about the thinking behind 
taking one approach versus the other and how, where you've settled? Well, we um, didn't, in H233, we were not changing jurisdictional triggers. Um, and in 926, we did go with the, the 2000 foot road rule. And um, that was actually based on a lot of looking at a lot of existing um, data. I, I didn't do the look, the ANR folks helped with that and the um, the NRC can speak to this more clearly how they came to that number, but certainly having a jurisdictional trigger um, related to fragmentation is also very important to, you know, how we manage and maintain development in our intact forested landscape. True. I mean, it's the attraction of the road rule, it would seem in part, it's, it's quantitative. So it's, it's uh, less of a qualitative assessment of impacts on areas of different uh, sort of ecological value. Is that part of what's, am I, I'm just trying to have a better feel for what draws the state's attention to being more involved in helping with the planning related to that kind of development? Is it as simple as you've crossed the 2000 foot line, so you're in, or is it, are we still using uh, subtler measures like the, the nature of the areas you're crossing with any um, development? Well, all of the other jurisdictional triggers remain intact. And so a development that would trigger Act 250 anyway um, would now be reviewed under this new um, forest block and habitat connectivity criteria. Yep. Okay. So any of them that trigger it, which we know is not the majority of of development in the state of Vermont. It's in fact um, quite the opposite. I think it's 25% or something of development. I don't have all the numbers on the top of my head anymore, but um, it's a much smaller fraction of the actual overall development that happens in the state that comes under the jurisdiction of Act 250. Um, and I would say we also have over 10 years, I can't remember the year that um, the road rule was removed, but it was a long time ago, maybe even longer ago, I think it was the beginning of my career. So that's well over 10 years. It was around when I first became aware of um, the law and then it went away quite quickly. And you can see there's great data on private roads and driveways out there that, that demonstrate the need, um, the infiltration essentially, you know, the, the landscape, we're seeing fragmentation um, and loss of forest cover for the first time in over a hundred years. And it's, it's adding up, you know, one development at a time, we really are, losing um, what many of us probably value the most without even knowing it. It was the, back, the backdrop of our um, green mountains and our recreational opportunities, um, sort of one long road or driveway at a time. So I think, you know, if we can reverse that trend by implementing the road rule, that'll be really, really critical. Okay. So you're educating me about something I didn't know. I, I, are you saying the road rule was once upon a time a yes. triggering criteria. Yes, and Ellen maybe knows off the top of her head when it changed. It was in the 90s sometime, I believe, right? Okay. Uh, it was in effect from 1975 until 2001. Oh, 2001. Okay, so yeah. so we have a, a fair number of years. Um, and honestly, like when I was getting ready to talk to, to you folks this morning, I was picturing the last time I was on Camel's Hump and looking at um, the um, residential infiltration into those forests that are right around um, our most pristine undeveloped mountain. Um, so it's, it's a factor in um, how, you know, we need to take it into account when we review development. Sure, sure. Well, I think probably all of us have had the experience of driving around the state to a place we haven't been for a while, a year or two. And as you drive through, you say, wait, there, there's a houseway up there now that didn't used to be there. You start, the things just keep appearing. So, um, all right, well, great. Anything um, else that you think, you know, is important that you want us to be keeping front of mind as we keep working? Um, no, I'm just really grateful that you're working on this and that I hope we can include it in a, in a package of updates to Act 250. I do think we didn't know about forest fragmentation 50 years ago and um, it's really, it's past due for us to include it. So I hope we can make that happen this year. So thank you for having me in.
Okay. Representative Sheldon. Mm -hmm. Senator Campion. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, good to see you. I, I was I'm reading the bill uh, and listening at the same time, so I did miss one piece where I just want to go back to the road rule. Mm -hmm. So this, this was in effect, then it came out and you're putting it back in. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's a slightly modified road rule um, based on, on some memories of folks who had to administer the previous road rule. I mean, part of what made it a target for removal was that it was difficult to administer. We've tried to address those concerns in the modified road rule. Um, one of the sticking points in the previous road rule was that it didn't um, accurately kind of assess the difference between a road and a driveway. Um, and it ended up resulting in some redundancies in the landscape that were um, even more harmful. So parallel driveways going down, you know, as a divided instead of shared driveways. So we've tried to make it, um, we've tried to address those issues around administration of it and also still hopefully have it be meaningful. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Right. And, and was that the, the reason too for, you know, an aggregate count uh, as opposed to the one by one by one? So you don't end up with a perverse unintended consequence of, as you point out, parallel driveways. And right. Like. Yes, that's true. That is exactly why it's accrued, kind of, you add it up. Okay, great. Um, any other questions right now for Representative Sheldon? Okay. Well, um, as everyone has said, good to see you. Thank you yep. for coming in. You're welcome. I hope you'll stick around. And if you hear something being talked about and you say, um, I would like to say something about that. Don't be altogether shy. Just find yeah, me down. I would appreciate it if you're able to stick around a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks. Um, with that, thanks again. Um, so I'd like to turn to Ms. Tchaikovsky. So you've helped uh, set us up for today by preparing some materials. Can you um, take us through what you've got lined up? Thank you. Sure. Um, Jude, can I share my screen? Um, I did. So on the website, I did prepare a PowerPoint um, as I've been sitting here rereading it. I already found a couple of errors, so I will highlight them as I hit them. But uh, I <laughs> made a PowerPoint to address the topics that Representative Sheldon was just talking about, fragmentation of forest blocks and connecting habitat. So. Let's open. Okay. So, um, your committee does have 926, the Big Act 250 bill from the House, and you've also just heard about S165, which has the same language as H233, uh, and the language was also in H904. So I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, but I think this committee probably remembers that bill well. Um, it did pass out of the house and then pass out of this committee uh, in 2018, but I'm gonna talk about the language a little bit. So to back up a step, we, 926 is based on the commission on Act 250, the next 50 years. The, the process that happened and some of their recommendations. So one of the major recommendations that came out of that committee was to address forest fragmentation. Uh, the commission uh, looked at a lot of the data that has been uh, uh, accumulated in the last few years, especially in the reports from VNRC and the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation about fragmentation that's happening. So, uh, the commission did recommend the language from H233. And, uh, but that language is no longer in 926, although there is there are some similarities between them. So, so we're gonna look at the different uh, similarities and differences. Um, and I think I may have missed a couple, but we can start here. So, um, The first thing that they they both do are add new definitions um, to Act 250. Uh, that's they're both on they're on a later slide, but this is one of the things that I uh, 
made an error on. The definitions in 233 and 926 are not exact. And one of the differences has to do with uh, the definition of forest blocks. So H233 did define forest blocks as areas that are specifically mapped as forest blocks. And that is one of the things that's left out of 926. So it's a small difference, but it is talking about the use of the maps that are required as how we define the forest blocks. So 9, uh, uh, 233 adds new subcriteria to criterion 8, uh, 8B forest blocks, and 8C habitat connectors. The burden of persuasion for these new subcriteria are on the applicant. Um, this is um, this is the same um, for many of the other criteria, and I'm only going to highlight it because the 926 does something slightly different, although very close. Um, H926 does not add new subcriteria; it amends criteria eight to include forest blocks and habitat connectors. And we'll look at the, the exact language in a moment, but it does not reference fragmentation specifically. So that's one of the, the main differences between them. Um, 926 though does add the new road rule, the new, the new old road rule. And so that is one of my slides that we'll get to. Um, 233 adds a new section to Act 250 that would address the mitigation of fragmentation. So both 8, B, and C set up this analysis about avoid, minimize, or mitigate fragmentation. And so it also adds this section about mitigation on how you do that. So you have the ability to pay a fee to mitigate um, the fragmentation. And so it requires the NRB to adopt rules as well as guidance for applicants. And it does require mapping. Um, which is similar in 926, um, although there is a study in 926 that's added um, that requests that they look at whether or not resource maps be added for the capability and development plan. So that's a, a slight difference, but let's look at some of the exact language. So currently under Act 250, there is Criterion 8, and Criterion 8 says that a permit will not have an undue adverse effect on the scenic or natural beauty of the area, aesthetics, historic sites, or rare and irreplaceable natural areas. There's also subcriterion 8A, which is separate, and that addresses necessary wildlife habitat and endangered species. So here is a side-by-side -side of the new language in both of the bills. And I apologize that the language for H233 is a bit small, but there's a lot more of it. And uh, posted on your website is are both of the, the bills in full, so you can look at them uh, more closely if you'd like. But it is sort of one of the primary differences between these language is how many words there are. So, um, what 926 does is, is a pretty streamlined approach, and uh, the H233 language is pretty detailed. So uh, let's start with the 233 language. So you all are pretty familiar with this. Um, it adds these two new subcriteria, forest blocks and habitat connectors. So it starts with a permit will not be granted for development or subdivision within or partially within a forest block, unless the, the applicant demonstrates that the development or subdivision will avoid fragmentation of the forest block. If that's not feasible, uh, if it's not feasible to avoid, the applicant must minimize fragmentation of the forest block. And if avoidance or, mitigate, or minimiz minimizing the fragmentation isn't feasible, an applicant can uh, mitigate the fragmentation. And there in 6094, the new section, there's a formula for how one can mitigate um, through 
payment of a, of a fee. Uh, it then lists methods for avoiding or minimizing the fragmentation. And it's a may include, so it's not an exclusive <laughs> list. Um, it includes locating buildings or other improvements and operating the project in a manner that avoids or minimizes incursion into and disturbance of the forest block, including clustering of buildings and associated improvements. It may also include designing roads, driveways, and utilities that serve the development or subdivision to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the forest block. Such design may be accom accomplished by following or sharing existing features on the land, such as roads, tree lines, stone walls, and fence lines. So I have a quick question about yep. this. So a lot hang a lot hinges on the definition of forest block and habitat connector. Um, yes. And can can you say, or right, we can wait to hear from agency? Um, I don't have a good feel for those maps. On one level, I could imagine that when I look out from Bristol to Lincoln and beyond, that I'm seeing everything I'm seeing almost is a quote unquote forest block, or I don't know if they're technical criteria that limit the definition to something, you know, a, a subset of what we would just generally call the forest. So on slide three, I, or slide five, I include the definitions mm -hmm. and I actually thought that they were the same as uh, between the two bills, but they're actually not. So these are actually the definitions that came out of 926. So in 926, forest block means a contiguous area of forest in any stage of succession and not currently developed for non-forest use. A forest block may include recreational trails, wetlands, and other natural features that do not themselves possess tree cover or in improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes. So that's what's in 926. Um, that would require some demonstration of evidence probably. Um, the definition in one in uh, 233 is slightly different. It's a forest block is a, contigu a contiguous area of, of forest in any stage of succession and not currently developed for non-forest use. That is mapped as an interior forest block within the 2016 interior forest block data set created as part of resource mapping under section 127 of this title as that data set may be updated pursuant to procedures developed in accordance with the rules. Okay. Uh, and then the rest is the same. So that sort of middle part about it being mapped as an interior forest block is what's included. Right, I know on my copy of the bill, I, <laughs> my note says, and what is the status of this you know, set of maps? You know, um, So we can come back to it, but um, the, I, I just so I'll flag it for, for something that we'll have to sort out a little bit because if we're using the term uh, as part of the trigger, then we'll need to know what we're sweeping up through the definition. Be clear about it. Thank you. Okay, so so we just talked about forest blocks, and in H two thirty three, the new sub criteria eight C habitat connectors is very similar in its structure. It also uses this um, avoid, minimize, mitigate fragmentation of a habitat connector structure. Um, small side note, habitat connector, that phrase has been changed um, multiple times. At various times, it was um, habitat connectivity area, connecting habitat, um, or habitat connector. So we can adjust it if, if it's confusing, but it is, a, um, it is defined uh, as, let's see, um, <coughs> land or water that link, or land or water or both that links patches of habitat within a landscape, allowing the movement, migration, and dispersal of animals and plants and the functioning of ecological processes. A habitat connector may include recreational trails and 
and improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes. And habitat means the physical and biological environment in with which a particular species of plant or animal lives. Well, these both yes. seem like they have the potential to be, you know, sort of encyclopedic in their scope, right? Because there's probably, there's just no part of the landscape where there's, it's not some critter's habitat. So I guess that's what, um, the sort out what kind of how, how the, and, and how it would be practically, you know, administered if literally everything out there is habitat for something. So how do we define it in a way where uh, people who want to do this work can manage it in a, it would just be manageable for them to take on the work. Uh, that's so I would say that um, 8C requires that you avoid fragmentation of a habitat connector. Okay. So the existing 8A already requires that you avoid um, the, that you will not destroy or significantly imperil necessary wildlife habitat. So um, this is a, a more broad standard in 233, but it is talking about fragmentation of the habitat. And so again, you'll need to, an applicant would need to provide evidence that if there is habitat on the property, which seems possible, you will need to demonstrate that you have not fragment, fragmented it, that there will still be able to be the, the movement between patches of habitat. <clears throat> and so one of the, the other things is that, as I mentioned with forest blocks, it lists the methods for avoiding. So uh -huh. <clears throat> methods for avoiding or minimizing fragmentation include locating buildings and other improvements at the farthest feasible location from the center of the connector. And that, um, I think in a lot of the testimony your committee took was sort of one of the keys is that you avoid the center. Fragmentation is about the splitting apart of a large piece of, of, a, of a swath. So how can you avoid the, crossing the center of a connector? Um, designing the location of buildings and other improvements to leave the greatest contiguous portion of the area undisturbed in order to facilitate wildlife travel through the connector. Or when there is no feasible site for construction of buildings and other improvements outside the connector, designing the buildings and improvements to facilitate the continued viability of the connector for use by wildlife. So I think you could potentially say that one of the advantages of the H233 language is is how specific it is and providing examples. Um, additional guidance will probably be needed, but it does provide some concrete examples of how these things um, can be demonstrated. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Any so, questions before we go on? Just check. <clears throat> okay, great, thanks. So, what 926 does is different. Um, it amends the existing criterion eight, and it does also end up with a eight A, B, and C, but it rearranges things slightly. <clears throat> um, another thing that it does that I already sort of mentioned, and we can talk about at another point, is it shifts the burden under eight, um, the burden of persuasion. So. 8 is, 8A is currently drafted so that the burden of persuasion is on someone opposing an application and almost all of the other criteria, many of the other criteria, the burden is on the applicant. <clears throat> so 8 in H926 now reads, <clears throat> ecosystem protection, scenic beauty, historic sites will not have an undue adverse effect on the scenic or natural beauty of the area, aesthetics, or historic sites. Necessary wildlife, habitat, and endangered species. A permit will not be granted unless it is demonstrated by the applicant that the development or subdivision will not destroy or significantly imperil necessary wildlife habitat or any endangered species. 
or if such destruction or impairment were, will occur. And then the new forced language is down in C, will not result in an undue adverse impact on forest blocks, connecting habitat, or rare and irreplaceable natural areas. If a project as proposed would result in an undue adverse impact, a permit may only be granted if its effects are avoided, minimized, and mitigated in accordance with rules adopted by the board. So it does include the avoided, minimize, and mitigate, but it also uses the undue adverse impact um, assessment that is already in um, criterion eight. Okay. <clears throat> so, Uh, <clears throat> sorry. So because uh, H926 uh, is amending Criterion 8, there are some, um, <clears throat> there's some information on how this analysis would happen. So undue adverse impact on forest blocks, connecting habitat, and, ir and rare and irreplaceable natural areas. So rare and irreplaceable natural areas is an existing element of criterion eight. So we can look at some of the analysis on how that might happen. So you would probably use the first part of the Queechee's Lake analysis about adverse impact. So will the project be in harmony with the surroundings? Does it fit in the area? And there is some case law about when a project is being um, proposed in a forested area, whether or not that would be um, in harmony with the area. So there is some existing case law about that. And then undue impact under rare and irreplaceable natural areas includes failure to take reasonably available mitigating steps. Um, so, and I, so I didn't draft this language, but it does also include the avoid, minimize, mitigate. So I'm not quite sure how that would play out, but I guess it would probably be part of the undue impact analysis. Um, so. And the um, reasonably available mitigating steps, uh, this, is there, are these basically related uh, terms of art and existing case law, stuff like that. So the reasonably available mitigating steps are relatively clear, or is that what will be specified by guidance through NRB? How is that going to get spelled out so people, um, I mean, my, my basic take is people often want to comply, but we have to, we should try to make it uh, relatively easy and clear for them as they're making plans on how they would comply. Um, so that is a, there is existing case law on that in re, in regards to rare and irreplaceable natural areas, um, and so there is some information. Uh, I'm not sure what it exactly will look like, but H926 does require that the NRB adopt rules and provide guidance on that. <clears throat> Um, so I did already talk about this definition page. So this is the definitions that are included in H926. It's not in both of them, but um, I've already read connecting habit and force block. So fragmentation, uh, that is one of the largest concepts that we're talking about here. And one of the things that is interesting to me is that 926 includes this definition of fragmentation, but it's not um, used in the bill anywhere. So it's left over. Um, but fragmentation means the division or conversion of a forest block or connecting habitat from the separation of a parcel into two or more parcels. 
the construction, conversion, relocation, or enlargement of any building or other structure, or of any mining, excavation, or landfill that may change in the use of any building or structure or land or extension of land, use of, of land. However, fragmentation does not include the division or conversion of a forest block or connecting habitat by a recreational trail or by improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes below the elevation of 2,500 feet. <clears throat> so, do you, the next slide I have is about the road rule. Do, is there, are there questions before I move out of the Criterion 8 stuff? <clears throat> Sounds good, I don't see any, thank you. Okay, so as mentioned, there is a new jurisdictional trigger called the road rule. Um, as I mentioned before, the road rule was a prior jurisdictional trigger. It was in existence from 1975 to 2001. Um, in 2001, so, so during that time, it wasn't, it was a rule of the Natural Resources Board. It was not in statute. And the, the Natural Resources Board, the board at the time, amended it many times in its 20 year, 26 year existence um, because as a new project would come up, they refined it. It was difficult to um, understand and administer. So they, they amended it multiple times in its 26 year existence. And then in 2001, the legislature actually repealed it, which is a slightly unusual action because they repealed a rule of the board. But what they did was uh, Act 250 was amended um, in sort of a trade-off. So the road rule was repealed, but the, um, the definition of subdivision was amended to lower the jurisdictional trigger to six lots um, in areas with permanent zoning, so without permanent zoning. So it lowered the jurisdictional trigger for subdivisions as sort of a trade-off. And that was considered a, a fair trade-off because the purpose of the road rule, as uh, Representative Sheldon mentioned, is to get at the smaller um, size development and uh, more unusually shaped development. So um, this, the road rule is very long. Um, it's a little unwieldy. I have broken it down on the next page into its elements. So we're talking about the definition of development here under Act 250. So it's a jurisdictional trigger. So it's the, the construction of a road or roads and any associated driveways to provide access to or within a tract of more than one acre, uh, within a tract of land of more than one acre owned or controlled by a person. Any new development or subdivision on a parcel of land that will be provided access by the road and associated driveways is land involved in the construction of the road. The length of the road and driveways in combination must be greater than 2,000 feet to trigger this jurisdictional trigger. Um, and then there is some qualifying language. So roads shall include any new or improve, new road or improvement to a class four road by a private person, including roads that will be transferred or transferred to or maintained by a municipality after their construction or improvement. The lengths of all other roads and driveways within the tract of land constructed within any continuous period of 10 years commencing after July 1, 2020 shall be included. It does not include state or municipal roads, a utility corridor of an electric transmission or distribution company, or a road used primarily for farming or forestry purposes. 
but the conversion of a road used for farming or forestry purposes that also meets the requirements of this subdivision shall constitute development. Great. Seems relatively straightforward. Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, I it, have been. It, do, oh, go ahead. Senator McDonald. It, this was uh, it, this year was just before the big press pressure for um, cell towers came in, which was kind of interesting. Because uh, so suddenly cell towers became uh, elect, you know, were eligible for the road, um, and some of them went straight up hills. So it's just I mean, historical, for what it's worth. I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so this language is um, a bit different from the last iteration of the road rule. And one of the primary differences um, is that it includes road and associated driveways. Driveways were left out previously. And it also increases the length to 2,000 feet. Um, the, pr the last iteration of the road rule was 800 feet. Um, so yeah, 800 feet. Uh, the, the old road rule had a, I have been doing a lot of research on the, old, the, the former road rule. Um, there were a lot of issues in implementing it. This is a bit simpler. Uh, the old road rule sort of, um, <clears throat> it was an either or. It was either 800 feet um, of road or a road that would serve five or more parcels of land. Um, so, yeah. And in this iteration, it's that it's 2000 feet, whether it's getting to one parcel, one develop, whatever, one home, let's say, versus <clears throat> seven homes. And on one or more acre. Uh -huh. Um, I think that's all I have prepared. Um, there is a lot of information in this sort of realm. <laughs> <laughs> so it could be one of the understatements of the day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it's very helpful. So can um, just as I, I'm, I'm trying to knit together the things in my, in my head that you've been sharing with us. What's the relationship between the road rule and um, so this is a jurisdictional trigger uh, for Act 250 review, and then it's like, okay, so what's what are how are we doing the review, and if we're in the, to make all the connections, if we're in a forest block or going through a habitat connector. Now we're also saying, okay, if you're developing within those areas, we're going to guide how that development occurs. For instance, the, uh, the reduce, uh, the avoid, reduce, mitigate paradigm. So that's how the two of them work. One triggers and then the other one guides the nature of the development once you've triggered the review. Yes. Okay. So, so roads that trigger Act 250 under this rule will need to address the new um, sub-criterion 8C, um, but so will all other types of development. Right, okay. And if someone were to say, oh, well, the, the new, the 8ABC um, is enough, you don't need road rule trigger um, I, I'm just trying to understand how that does is sort of quote unquote is or is not necessary or advisable or desirable. I'm just trying to understand that one a little better. So one of the things that the road rule is trying to get at is that the, as we talked about um, yesterday, the, the triggers for Act 250, what is development are, um, it's the size of the parcel normally. So it's 10 acres or one acre. And in a 10 acre town, 
I think we do often find that there are many projects that happen on <clears throat> less than 10 acres and they do still have environmental impacts. So the road rule gets at smaller developments that may have significant impacts. Okay. So, um, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, the, Senator Cummings used to say if uh, someone is making, has a logging operation and they build the first class road, um, that's where development is going to occur. Um, and I think, and I, I'm, you know, I'm often guilty of analogies, but one of the problems that development has wrestled with would be when a town um, runs a sewer pipe uh, from the town a mile and a half away or two miles to the school. And they say, this pipe is going to the school to make the school operate, et cetera, et cetera. And they get that pipe in. And then as soon as the pipe is in, um, businesses and homes want to do strip development between the town and the school on the sewer line. Um, that's the dilemma that you have when you build roads. So um, it's not what you're building the road for, it's the demand on that road after it's built. And I, that, that's sort of the policy conundrum that you get into when you're dealing with that. And for those that are really crazy, they might look up Google, the Bosman Road and Red Clouds War, which was a road proposed by the military and opposed by the Sioux Nation. And the parallels are quite similar. Well, thank you for that. All right. Um, so did this committee have any other questions for Ms. Tchaikovsky right now? No, thank Great. you. Well, thank you very much for um, distilling out that information. It makes it a lot easier to see what we have in these three different bills plus current law. Um, great. And with that, then um, I'd like to turn to uh, some of our other guests. Um, and I think first I'd like to turn to Commissioner Walk um, to lead off on the uh, a &R team. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Commissioner Walk, uh, Peter Walk, Commissioner of DC. For the record, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak again. I did leave you uh, with a bit of information, uh, maybe incomplete at the end of your discussion yesterday and wanted to sort of expand upon that uh, given where you're going and, and uh, how we'd like to be helpful with that discussion. Um, I guess I would, I wanted to frame the sort of context of what we'd, we'd recommend that you move forward with from the kind of broader context that, that uh, Brian Shoup from the Vermont Natural Resources Council and I uh, briefed you on sort of early on in the session, if you'll recall, where we described what has been sort of termed the joint proposal um, that was a series of, of uh, reforms and modernizations to Act 250 that would um, create, create a, a more effective process and structure and address areas of criteria and jurisdiction that we thought uh, were appropriate when we thought we could provide um, some sort of useful uh, context for where there might be areas of agreement. Um, we, as you know, it came as a shock to some people that our two organizations uh, were willing to sit down together and work on those issues, but this bill, this act, this law is incredibly important. And at 50 years, there are a number of things that, that that either don't work as well as they should or don't protect the things that need um, uh, need to be protected. So we thought it was a worthwhile effort. That, that package of concepts contained a number of, of pieces uh, that uh, Representative Sheldon's committee considered, included some, didn't include others. And as I told you yesterday, sort of as, as, as we looked at 926 as it came out of the house, it, it didn't meet our 
uh, our goals for what we were hoping to accomplish. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't pieces that are important to do. Uh, we just think that because of the nature of, of the, like, the complexity of this, uh, of the, this law and how it gets implemented, it's important that we do that we that we maintain that conversation that we do the, the the further work that's needed and so i guess that is my primary concern as you're considering a a slim down version of of 926 or whatever pieces you're planning to put together is that there has been a lot of conversation over the last four years about all sorts of other topics about governance of act 250 about sort of management of the resources about whether or not they're adequately staffed, about whether or not things like uh, fish and wildlife have the resources available to do the regulatory review, which is gonna be especially problematic as we get into the budgetary context we're in now. Um, so I, my, my comments are today are gonna be reflective of what I think is, is possible and meaningful in this moment and to and to allow those of us who care about this to continue to work on those discussions and to and if you want to put them in into ask us to further study them and bring back recommendations we're happy to do that um, but i would if you're going to create a package of items to move now uh, I'll, I'll offer the following recommendations um, we do think uh and we were it was at our suggestion the language um, around uh, adding uh, forest blocks and connectivity habitat to the criteria were added. Um, that was a way to, uh, and, and the rulemaking process established to be able to get into the level of detail that's necessary to really be clear with all parties to the process to know how to interact with that work. We understand that H233 and S165 have more detail in them, but as Ellen mentioned there's always going to need to be more um, as we implement regulatory programs to be clear with everybody how that works. And so a rulemaking process that defines that makes sense. Um, so we believe that should be part of, of whatever package you move forward. That is something that we proposed, actually we proposed in Senator Parent's bill two years ago. Uh, Senator, Senator Bray, I'm wondering, I'm just, uh, it's gonna be, maybe it's not, difficult for anyone else to follow, but is there sort of a side-by-side -side you might share with us uh, as you, I'm not sure if you're right now suggesting changes or if you're, if you are um, just talking about what you support or maybe just make it a little bit more clear. When I, you're I'd be happy. I'd be happy to be very clear about what we support. We support moving or, forward. Or don't, or what you'd like removed. Or we, we support moving forward with the criteria changes. Uh, related to forest blocks and connectivity habitat that we proposed originally in uh, Senator Parent, I think it was S-104 uh, two years ago, and that was included in H-926. I'm sorry, um, they, they are in H-926? They are in H-926, yes. Um, and, I, and I would ask, you know, you're going to get more detail on this from Commissioner Snyder, um, but I'm laying out the broad strokes of what we think is appropriate at this point. Um, I would agree with, as I just mentioned, that a critical piece to doing that, if we're going to explain that criteria, expand that criteria review, is fish and wildlife having, or all agencies having go back authority is particularly relevant for fish and wildlife, as they do not receive adequate funding to do that review. I know Commissioner, Commissioner Porter uh, requested to testify to that effect before this committee, and I would encourage you to hear from him. Okay. Um, Commissioner Walk, so is, is this, uh, in essence, the same kind of authority that ANR has when you're called upon by the PUC to do evaluations of economic, uh, environmental impacts for energy projects? I believe it is the same. Yes, I can. I would have to look at the, the language, but Ellen is nodding her head. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, as Along with that, um, and Commissioner Sauer will go into more detail here, when you passed Act 171 several years ago, the idea of looking at forest fragmentation included the idea of making sure that the forest products economy was working so that there weren't uh, private home development pressures on our working lands or, or that those were lessened. 
And so the, that piece that we've included into providing some regulatory certainty and relief for the forest processing industry is something that we believe is critically important. Um, and I, there are some, there are a, a tweaks to the to that that we would actually further like to see from from the language that's in 926 um, that Commissioner Snyder and Deputy Commissioner Lincoln can and can uh, suggest to you tomorrow when they when they uh, testify on that part. Okay, um, and if um, just because we are in short on time mode. Anytime anyone has suggested language changes, I would just encourage you to send them along to the committee because um, the sooner we start seeing things in black and white, the, the sooner we'll make we can make clear decisions. Thanks. Sure. Uh, and then finally, we believe as you're going to discuss tomorrow that it's important to to work to address uh, how trails are regulated under Act 250 or reviewed by the state in general. Uh, there is a process that is established in H926 um, that would be um, that that we think is a, a, that could be appropriate, but we do think there's an opportunity to sort of to get to the end of that process faster um, and could suggest language accordingly. The other piece um, that that is we believe to be important, and this would uh, moving to that end state um, sooner would. Would help address this is that there are there are projects that are in in limbo at the more at the moment and having a, a moratorium on on new on jos on from act 50 would be appropriate to make sure that we can address this in whole in full and not leave people who are currently in in some status behind um and those are the pieces that we think if you're going to if those are those sort of forests uh or excuse me and the last piece that i didn't mention was the pieces that are uh, the, the issues associated with designated downtowns and uh, addressing jurisdiction uh, there. So um, those that that is our what we believe is an appropriate approach that gives you the three legs of the stool that you're hoping to accomplish, and um, and we think is appropriate to move forward. Okay. Um, quick question on the JOs. So I have I just don't know in terms of history and precedent. Is it, uh, has the legislature ever intervened in that kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, you know, a legal process outside of the legislature while there's something pending? Um, I'm just trying to make sure that if we were to agree that we're not doing something uh, legally ob objectionable, you know, like, Inter, kind of like intervening in a case by changing the law at the moment while the case is pending or something. I think that is a fair question uh, from from the legal counsel, you know, from our legal counsel that they do not see that as a concern. But um, you obviously have your own legal counsel who, who might be able to weigh in on that. that yep. Okay. Well, I just didn't know if you had considered it and you know, it's, it's, gave it a it's, clean bill of health already on your side it is it is something we've considered and, and not seen it to be a, a concern okay thank you um any anything more you want to share with us before we go to mr S uh Snyder? no i just I, I given given how you've divided up your days if i and that what the way i left things yesterday i just wanted to make sure that you knew exactly where we stood uh, so that you can you can have that information available to you rather than us responding piece by piece. Okay, great. Well, thanks thanks for that. And you know, uh, so m my take is uh, I'm going to re I'm going to edit. I've been talking about a three legged stool, but based on my notes and your comments, uh, I suppose it's uh, up to a five legged stool in a way. So we're talking about forest blocks, habitat connectors. Um, and in terms of trying to address uh, fragmentation, talking about bill back authority to fund A and R when they're participating in such proceedings, we're talking about uh, further facilitation and clarification of the forks products, forks forest products and processing. We're talking about um, facilitating how we move forward on trails, and we're talking about traveling together. 
Uh, Chris, we're losing you. I think we've okay. lost. I, you I'm, so I don't know how many of the five things I got trails. You got the, all the first four, I think. Okay, and then the last was the downtown development provisions of S two thirty seven. Um, the only pieces that I would add to that, and these are minor and have a consensus across the board, is that there were, in H926, there were criteria changes made to 1D and uh, 5 uh, that are consensus in nature. The 1D changes relate to Senator Campion, your concerns over river quarters and making sure that they the language in Act 250 matches the modern science and the way we approach river quarters. Um, so that's, I just want to flag that those would be great to fix if if you are going to pass something and they are non-controversial. Okay. Um, Commissioner, are you saying 1B is in boy or D is in dog? 1D is in delta. Got it. Thank you. All right. Any committee questions for Commissioner Snyder? I mean, sorry, for Commissioner Walk? I'm happy to let Commissioner Snyder answer all of my questions. Yeah, I'm looking at one and saying the name of the other. Okay, with that, um, then thank you for helping clarify where we are and what's in what's moving. Uh, I'd like to turn then to Commissioner Snyder to talk to us more about Today's topic, the, all the force block and fragmentation habitat connector work we're looking at. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. I think it's still morning. And uh, yeah, for the record, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. I appreciate the invitation. As you know, um, we've been, uh, this is a subject that's very important to us. Uh, been involved, and we've presented uh, lots of information, data, anecdotes, even uh, for many, many years now, going on a decade, uh, even since before the fragmentation report to the legislature of 2015, which I led and uh, was the principal author of. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I, you know, and having listened all morning. Uh, and particularly with Peter kind of setting it up for the administration here. Um, I, I think I, I, uh, I'm not sure where to start. I mean, I wanna be respectful of time. Um, we have great interest, uh, we've contributed. I have um, information, technical information, other, um, I guess I'd uh, I'd say, how, how can I be helpful at this point having heard everything you've heard so far in particular what Peter um, just summarized on behalf of the administration. How, how can I be helpful? Um, well, one thing is, uh, if you could refresh our memory a little without spending, you know, two minutes sort of a thing. We saw the presentation room 11. We've talked about it. I think we're all in agreement. But um, can you just give us a brief snapshot of what you find compelling about the work on force frag and habitat connectors uh, right now? Sure, and um, I think Representative Sheldon actually teed that up pretty well, have kind of concisely summarizing. Um, forests are ha have an outsized role and value in the quality of life and from in, in the very nature of Vermont, the quality of life, the economy, the culture, and we are at this point lucky to have sort of an accidental experience with that we have forests. Uh, and that we have long said there should be a lens in land use planning and regulation that, that, un, that, that includes forests and their values to us, particularly these forest blocks and the connector values, uh, the connect, connecting habitat values. Um, and that they are, we've called and you all have listened and that, that that's the point that forests matter. There's uh, this broad suite of values and benefits that accrue to all. Um, from ecosystem services to economic benefits to the scenic backdrop, et cetera, as again, Representative Sheldon touched upon. And she made the point that it's, it's even more important now in the COVID era and the um, expected economic um, kind of decline related uh, that these forests play this outsized role and we are smart to pay attention to them. And I think the point here is in how we pay attention to them the work that's been done in these various forms of legislation that would uh, address forest fragmentation, uh, I think have, we've come a long way. And the original uh, report 
you know, we had five buckets, if you will, of policy recommendations, areas for policy development, landowner enhancements, uh, conservation. Um, we've done all of them. We've done a lot, surprising amount of work together on filling in each of those buckets in various ways, including land use planning and regulation through Act 171. Um, and I guess, uh, so having a criteria, an enrichment of the criteria that says forests matter and we should consider those in development planning uh, and regulation. That's, as Peter said, that's, that's good, that's there. Um, I guess for my part, I would suggest there's a missing piece, which we'll get to tomorrow, I'm pleased to hear, which is the, the one piece, arguably the most impactful that we really haven't gotten to is, is the economics of forest ownership which speak to, which, in, which is complex, but in this case, in the Act 250 context, it, it comes up in considering permit reform for enterprises that add value uh, to forest-based products, particularly our issue with uh, uh, the creation of um, high volumes of low value forest products, which we export out of state by and large uh, for value adding. And our point would be um, before we get to the point of having to make a decision about subdivision and, and permitting and how to do a subdivision, which is what we're talking about here with regard to forests, we want to be, have a, a economic um, opportunities and a marketplace. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Mr. Chair. I just I, I appreciate the philosophical. My connection is getting a little unstable. Senator uh, Campion, can you jump in? Thanks. Yes, I, I don't know if everyone can hear me. I'm looking to Senator Parent. Shake your head if you can hear me, Senator Parent. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm wondering, Commissioner, if you support the, the return of the, the road rule, first of all. Um, no. I mean, we, you heard from Peter, you've heard from others. Uh, that's, uh, I think the road rule um, is worth pursuing and considering, and you've heard this from us, uh, we feel this isn't... Uh, it's it's out of proportion. It's out of it, it, it's 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 inappropriate time to do it um, in this package. Uh, Can you tell so, me why? I'm just again trying to get a good sense of why it's why it's the wrong time. <clears throat> I think I can. I think without the other pieces of reform, which has been absent from this conversation uh, today, uh, in how Act 250 is conducted, sort of the, the, the governance, et cetera, that Peter mentioned, that's not here. And that would need to be part, I think plugging back in a road rule without those other changes is really problematic uh, and, and would be very difficult to do, frankly. Because what would happen if the road rule were put back in? And this truly is, I'm just, Trying to understand, you know, thinking back to your presentation in room 11, um, you know, I think we all supported this, you know, the work that you're doing. Uh, we're all concerned about forest fragmentation. It seems to me that returning the, the road rule, this is, seems to me like it's a good time to do it. And I'm just struggling with why it, it isn't. It's just too much. It's, it's too much. It's too big, and especially at a time when so much is in jeopardy with regard to ownership and stewardship of the landscape. Uh, we're focused on decisions at, at the point at which a decision has been made to develop. And then we, and it's really important to think about how we develop. Uh, and I'm for that, you know that. Uh, right, absolutely. But, but without those other pieces that support other avenues for, for land ownership and stewardship, uh, we, we can't just jump to the road rule at that end, it's it's missing this uh, these other important pieces, and so that to me, it's part of the package conversation. And I think we should be pursuing it. We should look at it, and uh, and I just don't think we have the wherewithal to make it happen now uh, in that larger context. But don't we need additional jurisdiction? I don't know that we do. I I, I think that what I, I think that things we need, and there's a lot at stake, and with, that's the part we all agree on. And I think it's really down to the details. And for me, it's it's, it's it just seems a bit much, a bit too fast w without the rest of the, uh, I think Peter's tried to help see what could be part of this in a balanced way. And I think we're legitimately working to find that. We just don't happen to think the road rule can be can be balanced in this mix at this time. Senator Bray, if, if I might jump in. Um, I if would I just... could add one thing, I just feel like we've, we've talked about the road rule for, 
it's it's not really new. I know we've had this conversation, I think, since I've been on the committee. I mean, it's been looked at and considered for the past four years. I just um, so. so Senator Campion, I would I would just correct you that we we brought the road roll back into the discussion this January as part of the joint proposal because we looked at all of the other ways in which it was looked at as how uh, things might be considered to address forest fragmentation as part of a much broader package. Yeah. And it, it seemed to be the one that had the, the fewest uh, issues associated with it. But that doesn't mean that in the context of just stripping that piece out, you can, you can just put it back into place. The road rule was removed and modified con you know, throughout the process, as you've heard, because there were challenges with its administration. Since then, significant changes occurred within the structure and function of the way the way Act 250 is overseen. And so to just plug and play without thinking about broader, broader reforms that may be needed is not, we don't believe to be appropriate. So it's not a why not just do this as well? It's a, these pieces all fit together in how they interact. Because I mean, we did discuss this, you know, in the commission on the act uh, on, you know, looking at Act 250. So, I mean, I feel like it, it's, I don't know if Representative Sheldon is still there. Uh, um, so anyhow, I, I guess uh, we can continue to explore this point as a committee. Thank you. Right. Um, so the, and just so that, can you speak plainly to what it is that on the governance side, which we're, we're not taking on because, you know, the shorthand for it in the building this past session has been the quote unquote professionalization of the board. So um, I'm not sure what was happening with the road rule that you see as sort of I guess in a way beyond the capability of the current governance structure to implement well. I guess right. I think what, what you're asking is what does governance have to do with the road rule? Uh, I think others right. can speak to this better than me and are more appropriate to speak to it. I would just simply say that my understanding of it is that when we had the road rule, which I remember and when it went away, um, the other things have changed since too. And just to, to simply say, well, it was there, put it back in is folly actually, because other changes have happened. We need to address those. Governance is a piece of that. And again, I think others should speak to this. It's it's beyond my purview. Right. That's All I need to know is what is the connection between governance and the road rule? Because governance affects how we operate the entirety of Act 250. And we'd like to have those conversations about when we expand jurisdiction to make sure that the thing that the whole program is functioning. And so that's how that's how they are interlinked. You are creating an expansion of juris. You would be creating a significant expansion of jurisdiction in a program where there's been significant testimony in the House that the current structure is not is not functioning as well as it should be. And so those things should be addressed in tandem if you're going to move forward. If you're going to move forward with one change or another. And so creating a package that makes meaningful policy changes today in this moment makes sense but they should be surgical if you're not going to look at the entire package of, of of things that need to be addressed okay um anything else uh commissioner snyder that you would like to uh, bring the committee's attention to before we go on uh thanks i i think okay. um no i i, I think it's been covered and you know, there's these other pieces that I, I, I I'm, I'm really glad to hear that they're still in the mix that we'll speak uh, to tomorrow in the forest processing and the recreational trails. Um, because I think they are appropriate and a big piece of this and would encourage that they're part of the anti-fragmentation. That's my point is that in addition to thinking about blocks and how we treat them in the planning and uh, permitting, it's um, these other aspects are, are also helpful in forest in maintaining forest integrity and health. And that's what we're here for. Okay, I see the chairs disappeared, it looks like into the, the 
Uh, Senator Bray, are you there? If not, I think we probably should just move on to uh, our next witness. It looks like he's... <laughs> okay, let's, uh, thank you. Uh, is Who's uh, next on the list? Um, oh, there you are, Senator Bray. Right. I, you disappeared for a while, so we thought maybe we'd move on to the next witness. Yes, well, that perfect timing. Um, just having a little internet thing. I keep cutting in and out, so it's a bit herky jerky. Um, with that, I'd like to, yes, please. So uh, invite Mr. Well, we have both Mr. Shoup and Mr. Fidel with us. So uh, you can decide if you'd like to go in the order that you're uh, in, in which order you'd like to go. Um, I think we'd prefer if uh, reversing the order and having uh, Jamie Fidel go first. And, and just to be okay. clear, I, I, I see on your agenda, Sam Lincoln was on the schedule. Right. I think so. Uh, I figured we always we often invite people to bring everyone on their team that. Uh, so I figured if, if Commissioner Snyder wasn't calling on uh, uh, the deputy commissioner that that we there was nothing more to add. Before, so let's check in. Mr. Um, Chair, could I just comment on that? I, I think I'd be you helpful. Wanted to can I clarify something, Mr. Chair, please? Sure, please. On that point, I appreciate uh, Brian mentioning that. Uh, so just to be clear, I had actually asked you if we could include uh, uh, Deputy Lincoln, and you were gracious enough to do so. I actually meant that for tomorrow in the processing conversation. So we're good right now, and thanks for, for checking. Yeah. Great. So uh, as I said, we would like to reverse order, and, and I'll turn it over to Jamie. So our, sorry, this is very awkward for me because I lose five and 10 seconds at a whack here. Um, so are we all set then, Commissioner Snyder? And We're all set with Commissioner Snyder and now we're gonna hear from okay. Jamie Fidel. Go ahead, Jamie. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jamie Fidel with Vermont Natural Resources Council. Uh, good to see you all. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all about addressing forest blocks and forest fragmentation in Act 250. I, I, um, I feel like this has been uh, an ongoing important conversation and you've already hit on the history uh, on this issue. And so I'm not gonna go through all the detail. I actually put together some written testimony that I sent to, to Jude this morning and hopefully you'll have it as a reference just so you can see our um, going through the history of, of how much the Vermont legislature has been focused on forest fragmentation over the last six years, consistent annual review of what is the issue um, and how to address it. And I've been doing a lot of work with a group, the Forest Partnership. And so while I'm testifying on behalf of the NRC today, just wanted you to know that there's a, a, a community of conservation organizations um, and, and it's been a priority for, for all of them to address forest fragmentation. And uh, the partnership is Audubon Vermont Trust for Public Land, Vermont Chapter of the Nature Conservancy, Vermont Land Trust, VNRC and, and Vermont Conservation Voters. So um, we've been working with your committee for many years now on these issues. And we do agree um, in a nutshell and uh, Act 250 should be improved in two ways. I'm going to talk about uh, strengthening the criteria, which you've been talking about, to either avoid, minimize, or mitigate impacts to forest blocks or connectivity areas. And then the second piece of it is we, we do think there, there needs to be some attention to the jurisdictional uh, side of things, the gaps that exist on the landscape that are not addressing the, the kind of the most egregious fragmenting types of impact. And Brian's going to talk about, uh, about the proposed uh, rule uh, that you have that would address roads and driveways. Um, but I did want to hit on just very quickly some of the research we've done, which I think um, provides a window into why that jurisdictional piece is an important part of, of your conversation. Um, and then I just want to offer a couple of clarifying um, thoughts on the, the criteria itself. Um, again, if you if you, um, if you look in my written testimony, there's been a lot of research and statistics over the years, shining a spotlight on the fact that we are 
for the first time in over 100 years, we're actually losing our forests. They're declining in, in extent. Um, Commissioner Snyder has led a bulk of excellent research highlighting these trends in, in the agency's fragmentation reports. Uh, the Forest Service as well has been analyzing this and statistics are, uh, they are what they are and, and they're not a great trend for our state. Um, you know, recent U.S. Forest Service reports suggest that Vermont may have lost up to over a hundred thousand. If I could have just interrupt, I, yeah. I do appreciate all this background. I feel yeah. like we do know it, to be honest, okay. uh, to be perfectly frank. I, I'm, I'd like to get down to some of these questions. Uh, yeah, let's do it. And, you know, and so I'd like you to, if you wouldn't mind, pick up where we left off around um, the road situation. Okay, well, I'm actually going to let Brian hit on the road situation. So I'd like to hear, yeah, actually, can you just tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this? Sure. Okay. Yeah. The reason it's needed, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this because okay. it's in the testimony, but it's important to set up why looking at ro long roads is important. Mm -hmm. um, we've done comprehensive subdivision research in Vermont to look at what's the average size of subdivisions that are happening and are they large enough to be triggering Act 250 based on the current jurisdictional rules that we have. So we looked at 22 case study towns between 2003 and 2009. We looked at 900, 925 subdivisions, poured through the subdivision records in the towns. They created over 2,000, close to 2,750 lots, affecting over 70,000 acres and only one to 2% of those subdivisions would trigger Act 250. They were not large enough to trigger Act 250 based on the lot requirements we have right now. That was startling to us because we realized, wow, wow. By and large, the overwhelming majority of subdivision development in Vermont does not appear to be going through any kind of Act 250 consideration. We probed that a little bit more and we found that's because the average subdivision in Vermont based on all of that research is two to four lots. And so subdivisions will never trigger Act 250 and they could have the longest possible roads associated with them. So when the road rule went away, there was no longer any ability to look at fragmenting impacts of development that's far reaching into intact working forest, forest blocks and natural areas. And that was something that we identified along with a whole entire land use planning community in Vermont as we put out multiple reports on how to address fragmentation the planning community has been very strong in acknowledging that because of these jurisdictional gaps, we are not addressing fragmentation from a jurisdictional perspective uh, in Act 250. And so that's a little bit of the history. I certainly personally uh, support doing something uh, to address those jurisdictional gaps. And Brian can hit on the policies that have been considered over the years, including the history of the road rule and why not the 926 proposal is, is what it is and how it would work. Thank you very, very much. Um, just to go through a little bit. You know, of, it, yeah. Well, as an aside, we know that whenever there's a, uh, a boundary condition, there are, in law we write, people come right up to the trigger line. So in education, there's a high spending limit. When it's 125, budgets come in at 124 and less. We move it down to 123, they come at 122 and less. So. Um, we know wherever you set the mark, it, it becomes uh, sort of a de facto in or out for regulation. So uh, we don't, we should try to avoid those sorts of unintended uh, encouragements to do certain things that fall just under a trigger. And I think. Yeah. And it's, it's right. And we do know of historical, you know, abuse of that, you know, roads that could be 799 feet instead of 800 and therefore you keep on having those on the landscape and all, all we're doing is cumulatively fragmenting without potentially review especially in towns if they don't have zoning uh, there's not much to look at um, as far as mitigating those impacts so um, I I did want to say that um, before I forget that we do support the bill back as it relates to the criteria um, it is important for the a &R to be engaged to be participating um, and to provide their expertise. And uh, we supported the bill back in, in the House in, in H926. 
think it is an important mechanism uh, for the agency uh, to be participating as the forest block and connectivity criteria um, hopefully becomes part of law. And, um, and so I just wanted to let you know that that is a, a third part of our platform of supporting work on fragmentation. Um, in regards to the criteria, um, as has already been alluded to, there's been, you know, the three reports from the agency, multiple VNRC reports, and then there's H233, as Alan highlighted, and then your committee, you know, also passed out criteria improvements to Act 250. So kind of a long track record. I, I think that actually the forest fragmentation criteria improvements in 926 have is the policy that's been vetted the most out of any of the Act 250 policies that are in play right now. It, it, it has, I think, the longest history of consistent legislative attention right now out of any of them. And of course, I'd enjoy to be corrected on that, but I just um, feel that this is a, an issue that's already been really vetted. There's There's been some consideration as, you, as you've done this morning as to whether you go with the 233 approach, which basically you know was clear. You like, like wetlands impacts, you try to avoid, you try to minimize impacts and then you mitigate impacts and you do that based on guidance H233 had a lot of specific recommendations as far as how you can minimize, um, in particular, fragmentation impacts through good site design. Um, the difference with 926 is it basically works with um, the existing uh, criteria that's in Criterion 8, but adds um, a robust rulemaking component to get at those details versus putting them all into the legislation. And so it sets up a standard, there'd be no undue adverse effect. Um, and the way that that would be done, then as it's clear in the rulemaking in 926, would be to come up with standards to avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts to forest blocks. And so if you haven't seen the rulemaking that's articulated in 926 on pages 60 and 61, it's really helpful because I think it provides the detail that you all have been asking through some questions uh, today, such as wh what are the role of maps? Um, how do you define these, these areas? What are the standards to minimize and avoid fragmentation impacts? Um, how would mitigation work? The rulemaking anticipates answering all of those questions. Um, what, what, the, what would not happen is there's not any um, triggers. There's no maps in H926 that creates a jurisdictional trigger. Um, the maps that have been alluded to are a resource to help applicants to understand, are they potentially in a forest block? And the rulemaking anticipates walking through how those maps could be helpful, but they're, they don't have a trigger effect. They're a resource to help and the rulemaking would not come into, uh, I'm sorry, the rule, the new criteria wouldn't come into effect until the rulemaking is done. That was a request from the regulated community so that the rulemaking gets things right and the rulemaking anticipates that there's a working group with the right stakeholders, including folks from the regulated community to work through the rulemaking so that there's comfort in how it would be designed. So I think if you have any questions about how would this work, the rulemaking anticipates answering them all. Um, before it goes into effect. Uh, Senator McDonald. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, half a dozen or more years ago, the, um, there was a, a committee that went around the state of Vermont looking at dealing with the, um, the current use and the penalties involved in current use. And it had a specific task and it interviewed throughout the state. And that issue was dealt with. But when the committee got back to Montpelier, one of the biggest surprises of the entire um, um, visitation and the committee's work was the number of individuals that came in and, and told us how many years their land had been in current use. And it was often 30 or 40 years. And the forest work had been done. And we had testimony that the people that own those forest blocks are old and are dying. And what was happening was that when they died, their, their kids or grandchildren inherited the property. And their grandchildren often lived in California, Florida, Washington, DC, Connecticut, overseas. 
And the kids didn't know how to deal with the management. If you had six heirs, you had, you had a problem. What happened to that land? And what we learned was that, that often the inheriting children and grandchildren would pay off the penalty on the land. And once they paid off the penalty, they could subdivide it amongst themselves and they could all get their inheritance in cash. And that this, this problem was, was growing as the number of people who own Vermont land um, are getting older. And many, many of their children and the, those who will inherit the land don't live here. And if when Jamie tells us that the forests are being divided up and cut in a way that is unprecedented and is a new trend, I su submit that the, the road show that we went on to listen to what was going on um, detected that trend about six years ago. And unless we do something, that trend is going to accelerate on, at, a, at a rapid basis. Um, you know, I know how old I am and I own some forest blocks. And um, when I pass on, um, before most of the people that are on this screen, um, something's gonna happen to them. And, you know, my kids don't all live and I have one that lives here and one that doesn't and I'm getting too personal, but this is a problem that is coming upon us and we can either deal with it now or shake our heads and pull our hair two decades from now and said, what happened? How did we miss this opportunity? Thank you. Thank you for uh, reminding us about that, that challenge, which I think it has came up then and it's been repeated um, pretty much every year since. You know, how, do we, how do we manage succession, successfully manage succession? Um, Mr. Fidel, do you wanna say something? Or Mr. Yeah, Shoup, are you ready? I am. I guess, Brian, if it's all right with you, I just have maybe two more points quickly, okay. and then I, I would quickly turn it over to you. Um, you have an excellent report that the Agency of Natural Resources did on intergenerational transfer and the statistics of how much land is expected to be turned over in a short amount of time based on the demographics of forest landowners. Um, and so that is an absolutely correct observation that's documented. Also, I'm not sure we presented the data that we've done from compiling grand list information from 2004 to 2016. But if you look at the categories of, of land in the grand list, that undeveloped forest land, um, which is categorized as woodland, had the highest rate of decrease across any category in Vermont, a 15% decrease over that study period. Now, a small portion of that may be because land went into public ownership, which is a good thing. But by and large, we saw undeveloped woodland moving into residential status as the most alarming trend, much higher rate of loss than farmland. And again, the statistics are documenting that the trend's happening. We do have subdivision. Contrary to the, um, the narrative that I think we, we all are under the assumption that we don't have population growth um, in, in Vermont, we do have subdivision. And that's what our reports have, have highlighted. And during that same study period, um, there were more than 20,000 parcels that had a new dwelling or residence on it over that study period. So we are developing our land. Um, I did want to just finally round out just a couple quick points on the criteria itself. Um, again, as, as um, Chair Sheldon said, the criteria is not set up to prohibit development in forests. It's an avoid, minimize, and mitigate concept, which will drive smart growth in forests, which we think is a good outcome. Again, it wouldn't go in effect until the rulemaking is done. So the rulemaking would address a lot of the questions that have come up. And I just wanted to be clear that there's been a lot of tension over the years that uh, recreational trails and forestry and agriculture have been determined to be compatible uses to Fragmentation criteria is not meant to try and prohibit those activities, but to see them as compatible, if not favorable activities in our forest blocks. And so we think that the criteria it's, itself has really been narrowly designed to look at the effects of, of subdivision development and address the gaps that are currently in the law right now. Okay. Um, so I, I'm just, 
uh, Senator Campion. So we heard from the commissioner earlier that, you know, that again, the roads piece, it needed, it just needed to be more of a comprehensive package, et cetera. You disagree with that. You believe the roads piece could go in as is uh, and, and bring it back and put it into law, correct? Yeah, I, I, if, if it's possible, could I address that, Senator Campion? Well, yeah, I, I just want to ask, I'm asking Jamie, so. Absolutely. I think okay. it's a critical component. Okay, great. Thank you. A quick side question. I don't want to take us off track for long, but in what way, to, to Senator McDonald's point about you know energy, intergenerational transfer and the kind of vulnerable place we're in, what is the role of the um, changes we're proposing or considering right now in terms of maybe mitigating that kind of transfer? How do you connect those two? Yeah, well, I think that if there's criteria in Act 250, as um, all too often the default happens, that somebody passes on, children inherit the land, and the person managing the estate says, let's subdivide. Um, if they're going to do it with a long road, let's say, that's going to um, impact large intact forest blocks, or they're going to do it with a number of lots that would trigger Act 250, then at least now there'll be attention to um, doing smart growth and mitigating impacts in forests. And so hopefully for those folks who want to choose the development path, at least now we've put a marker in that forest matter. And while we've addressed all the other important resources um, for by and large in Act 250, we have neglected how to be proactive about development in forests. And that's why I appreciate your attention to this issue so much. Okay, great. Um, if there are not any more questions for Mr. Fidel, then I think we should jump over to Mr. Shoup. Great. Uh, thank you, Brian Shoup, uh, Executive Director of Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, I, I had several things I wanted to, to make sure I get into the record, but I guess um, starting with the, the question Senator Campion just asked and the issue of, of governance, um, while we did uh, work, spend a lot of time working with the administration and the um, district commissions on governance, especially as it related to appeals and oversight of Act 250. Um, we do not agree in any sense that those issues should prevent the road rule from going into effect. The, the district commissions now, the district coordinators issue jurisdictional um, um, opinions all the time. That's, that's part of their process. Uh, while we would agree with the administration that we'd like to continue discussing how to improve the administration of Act 250 and the appeals process, um, that, that we, we just, we don't see the need to hold off indefinitely on addressing those kind of other issues in order to deal with the jurisdictional challenge that we're facing now. So um, we, we disagree with that. And, and with regard to your um, recent question, uh, Chair Bray, um, I, I, I think that the intergenerational transfer and the development pressure that will be brought to bear on Vermont that we're already seeing um, from other parts of the country, the, the, exactly the reason why we need the criteria and the new um, jurisdictional trigger, because we're going to see the development of our forest lands, and that needs to happen in a thoughtful, careful way, or we'll lose the land base that's so important to us and all the values that, that Commissioner Snyder has documented so well. So just right off the start, we think that the arguments against the road rule, um, we, we, just, we just don't agree or accept them. Um, in fact, I think that those comments about our, the transfer of land and the existing kind of uh, ability of our district coordinators to issue jurisdictional opinions, especially on a criteria that, as you characterize, Senator Bray, as a, as a quantitative criteria, it is something that doesn't require um, uh, a lot of interpretation or objectivity. Um, it will result, as you said, in some instances of people um, going right up to the brink um, to avoid Act 250, but we feel as though that will have a positive impact on avoiding forest fragmentation because it will rein in development. Um, a little bit of background on the road rule. It, it was, um, it was um, eliminated at the same time that the 10 acre loophole was eliminated. They were kind of seen as companion pieces. The 10 acre loophole refers to the fact that until 2001, a lot of 10 or more acres um, did not require a septic permit. So a 9.9 .9 acre lot had to be permitted by the state. Um, municipalities had the option of regulating septic disposal, but the state didn't as a whole. So regardless of soil types or the capacity of the land to 
um, accommodate wastewater, a 10.1 acre lot was allowed. It could go forward. So the thought was at the time, well, you don't need the road rule anymore. That was kind of a trigger to get at those subdivisions that had large lots and, and therefore large roads associated with them. And it turned out that, you know, the road rule, um, which we prefer the new version to refer to it maybe as the forced integrity rule, the old road, road rule um, served a, a bigger purpose than that. And, and that's why it was a mistake to have eliminated it. Um, it served the purpose of dealing with water quality on private roads and driveways, and also addressing forest fragmentation and wildlife habitat impacts. So um, th those are imp important goals that we hope you will move forward in considering that. Um, Commissioner Walk, I think, did a good job of explaining the various uh, other alternatives that were that were looked at. Um, the Commission on the Future of Act 250 and the House in particular looked at um, other triggers like ridge lines, uh, changing the elevations, um, using steep slopes or uh, wetlands as kind of re sensitive resource areas. Um, all of those involved mapping, all of those involved uh, kind of an automatic jurisdiction of any development, including a single family home. What this does is it looks at the scale of the development. Um, like, like we have a 10 units or more or a 10 or one acre town, this is, this is a, a easily administered um, provision for a district coordinator to, to, to apply. Um, and it doesn't have the kind of the, the impact of making everybody have to go through Act 250, regardless of, of the impacts of the development. It, it, it looks at, at it, it provides a choice to landowners with regard to how they, um, how, how they move forward with their land subdivision and development. Um, we did, would suggest one change to the uh, to H926. The road, the, there has been some concerns raised that um, a 2,000 foot road in a compact development in a designated area um, uh, in a smart growth location, so-called, um, should not trigger the road rule. We would suggest that you exclude all of those designated areas from the jurisdiction that it applies to, to address that concern. That would be growth centers, downtowns, village centers, et cetera. Um, I actually don't believe that, that, that um, that would trigger many developments in those areas because a 2,000 feet is a lot of road, and if you're serving compact development, you can get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of development in on a, on a small amount of road and driveway, which is what we're hoping to accomplish with the uh, the forest integrity rule. Um, but that said, um, th those areas I think would address some concerns that have been raised in the in the planning community. Um, one other thing I, I wanted to get into the record, and and this is. Not necessary, but I, I do want it to be part of the record. Yesterday, we spent a lot of time talking about smart growth in the downtown exemption, and as that being kind of the key to smart growth. I would want to um, um, ask you to take a look at, at the state's definition of smart growth principles, which are in statute, have been for about 14 years in 24 VSA 2791. Um, and those principles say that smart growth means growth that, um, among other things, protects the state's important environmental, natural, and historic features, including natural areas, water quality, scenic resources, and historic sites and districts, and serves to strengthen the agricultural and forest industry and minimizes conflicts of development with those industries. And it goes on to say that um, smart growth reflects a settlement pattern that at full build out is not characterized by scattered development located outside compact urban and village centers that is excessively land consumptive and the fragmentation of forest land and farmland. So, just, just want, to, want to put this in the smart growth context. You have um, done a good job, I believe, of, of over the years of, of vetting the issue of forest fragmentation and looking at the different uh, uh, ways to address it. Um, I think that this is really a moment in time where we found the right tools and we can move forward um, with uh, the, the piece, the, the, the forest criteria and the forest integrity rule, the revised road rule as a way to, um, as a way to uh, administer that, to apply that to scattered development out in our forest lands. And then I, I just want one other thing, um, uh, the difference between this and the old road rule and why the old road rule really kind of resulted in, in um, um, was problematic. It was not cumulative and it was, did not apply to driveways. So you would have subdivisions with three 790 foot roads. You'd have subdivisions that had a 790 foot road with eight 300 foot driveways shooting off in all directions, which was 
really counter counterproductive. Um, it, it caused scattered development. And by making it cumulative, applying it to driveways and, and making it a little bit larger to accommodate the, you know, it's not going to get the, the two, three acre lots that, that folks are going to be cutting off for their, for their kids or whatever, for, for extra income, you know, maybe unfortunately, but um, it's going to allow a certain amount of residential development and subdivision to continue outside of Act 250 jurisdiction, but it is going to get those um, large scale developments that really have a potential for, for fragmentation, water quality, wildlife habitat impacts, and other, other impacts on natural resources. Okay, okay that's very helpful. Um, anything else that we, you've been following the work with us for uh, days and weeks actually, anything that we haven't asked you that you, uh, you wanna cover? Um, no, you've asked great questions, and I um, hope that we've we've been able to answer them. I, I am, um, again, thinking that that uh, the road rule and the forest criteria uh, are definitely companion pieces. Um, one is the the you know the, the 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 criteria that we apply to development, and the other way is the other the rule is how we get there and how we apply it. Um, while we think the criteria as a standalone issue is a, an important step forward. It's, it's made much, much more meaningful um, and much more, uh, will be much more successful in addressing forest fragmentation with the road rule provision uh, as, a, as a companion to it. Okay, um, we'll be coming back to trails tomorrow, but so I'll just tee up ahead of time for our council and any, any of the other folks who are gonna be on that uh, meeting tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, to revisit the question of um, it, it, con the consideration of putting in a, a moratorium on implementing the JOs as they relate to trails in the state, whether that's a advisable or inadvisable and why. Um, so, okay. Uh, any other, uh, I just want to sort of loop back around the room here and see if um, we, uh, didn't include someone. I don't always see a hand up or something like that. Okay, so I want to turn to our own council who's been listening to everyone for an hour now. Um, I don't know if you have anything as our legal counsel that you're hearing come up uh, and you would want to flag it for us as there's uh, something that bears more scrutiny on the part of the committee based on the representations we've heard. Um, I guess one thing I would flag that was mentioned was um, the H926 language um, does involve, uh, ha has an involved rulemaking process that will take time. So there will need to be um, delayed effective date on that. Um, so that's just something to consider. Um, something that you haven't talked about is at one point, H926, when it had the H233 language in it, the committee spent a long time talking about the value of mitigation and um, whether it was appropriate for this kind of um, fragmentation of forest blocks and uh, connecting habitat. Um, there is a section, we didn't look at the exact language, but in 6094 uh, laid out uh, a process for the formula for mitigation. Um, so we haven't spent much time on it, but that's another um, issue about whether or not mitigation should be um, part of the process. Yeah. Um, and that was the part with uh, the ratio, the land ratios, and then invoking rulemaking. And, right. Uh, and that's pretty similar to the prime ag soil um, analysis that's done under nine uh, under nine B currently. Okay. Um, great. So thank you for highlighting that. So, all right. Well, um, if there's no other questions or comments for our guests. Uh, just want to thank everyone for a rich discussion this morning and we will we have a slightly compressed session tomorrow we have 10 to 11 25 uh, we have floor at 11 30 so uh, we'll be coming back and doing forest products and uh, touching base on trails again if there's nothing else uh, thank you everyone uh,
for your help today. And we are adjourned. Thank you.